Welcome everyone. My name is David Wood and it's my pleasure to chair this meeting of London Futurist today. Our topic today is the future of you. Can your identity survive 21st century technology? Our speaker is Tracy Follows, who I'll hand over to in a moment. She is a professional futurist consultant who works with global brands, specializing in the application of foresight to boost business, helping her clients to make decisions with the future in mind. She's a member of the Association of Professional Futurists and of the World Futures Studies Federation, and she was formerly head of strategy at Wired. Her recent projects include the future of work, responsible technology, age of ethics, future of media, future of marketing, future of crime and justice, future of retail, future of luxury, and sustainable futures. She was the winner of Adage Women to Watch 2017, Women in Marketing Award 2016 for Outstanding Contribution, and the inaugural Creative Strategy Lion Jury President at Cannes Lion International 2019 Festival of Creativity. As you listened to Tracy's opening presentation, if questions occur to you, please write them into the Q&A window, which you'll find a button to somewhere below the screen. And we'll come to these questions afterwards, prioritizing the ones with the most thumbs up vote. So bear in mind, you can thumbs up each other's questions. Tracy, welcome to London Futurists. Over to you. Thank you, David. And thank you for such a kind and generous introduction. As well, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of um, this series of London Futurist events. Um, it's good to be here. And I thought I would talk about the future of you because it is a subject I would hope that every single person is interested in the future of you, the, the future of them. I mean, if you're not interested in you and your identity, then it's, it's hard to know what you could be interested in. Um, I will say um, at the beginning, I don't have all the answers to some of the questions um, I'm going to pose and I do pose um, in the book, but um, I certainly hope that I am asking some of the right questions. And it is also an open invitation to other people to ask questions as well, because I'm trying to, with this book, get a dialogue going and get a debate going about some of these issues. I've already had sort of good conversations with David and a bit of debate. So the more people that can get involved, the better. I will just say that you might be wondering about the subtitle. Um, you know how these things are. We did ponder long and hard about the subtitle actually when we were developing this because it covers a, a lot of different areas. But the future of you, can your identity survive 21st uh, century technology is really um, is really the premise here. Um, now, partly the reason I'm asking that question, I suppose, is because I'm thinking about how technology is changing, how technology is changing society, um, and how technology is changing how society changes itself. Um, all of these things are going on, um, but it's also about the scope and the role and the survival of the individual because I think at the moment there's a there's generally a trend anyway towards a sort of communitarianism type of approach to a lot of things and I think we can safely say that that's understandable with everything that's happened during 2020 um, but I think it's more than that I think it's um I think it's the impact and the influence of the kind of technology that we use today so the internet by its very nature is a networked technology, it connects us and it interconnects us. And I guess one of the things I've been wondering about is in uh, an inevitably interconnected kind of society made real because of this technology, what is the role for the individual, the self, and how can one understand the self? So um, that's one of the questions I wanted to, to ask. And, and really ponder as I go through this, you know, is there still the role for you and me, or actually are we, are we going to be in a world where there is only ever the future of we now? Um, and that's, the, that, that, that's really one of the background questions. But the practical um, answer to that exact question, can your identity survive, is yes. Um, yes, it can survive and um, 
yes, indeed, it can thrive. So again, one of the things is that I do talk a lot, and, and actually I'll hopefully take you through some of the examples here, about the ways in which we can envision some negative scenarios that do put pressure and do um, threaten our identity. Um, but I don't want to spend that long on that because I think there are so many exciting ways in which the technology, um, digital technology and media are really helping us create and shape and express our own identities these days. Um, and I say identities in plural um, because it's not just our identity. This is one of the features of this technology is allowing us to seemingly have plural identities. Um, in a sense, we have a distributed identity across the web these days so we can thrive we can we can survive but we must engage in both of these today and think about some of the questions so that we can start to design uh, the kind of world we want tomorrow and therefore the kind of identity we want tomorrow now having said that i guess there are plenty of people who will say well but what what does it matter really and Obviously, when I've gone back through some of the philosophers and, and their points of view on identity um, and some of the more modern day thinking of it, there is, um, there is a belief that actually identity is nothing but an illusion. So it's illusory and that we don't really necessarily need to spend too much time thinking about it, dissecting it or trying to define it. Um, I still think it's worth trying to do, even if we can't exactly precisely define it we should still try to do that critical thinking because not only do we need to ascribe different rights and duties and responsibilities to different entities and different people we need to know who those individual people are it's actually much broader than that and I love this idea um, from Roger Scruton that actually it's not just the duties and responsibilities you know the difficult stuff it's really the lovely emotional stuff so as he says emotions such as anger love, admiration, envy and remorse would vanish and with them would vanish the purpose of our life on earth. So if we couldn't ascribe emotions to an individual entity, then we couldn't really, you know, live um, the way we would want to live life on earth. And I guess that comes down to one of the truths around this, which is um, we have to live by negotiation. We have to get the consent of others and, and rub along with sort of colleagues and companions and compatriots. But we also, in doing that, need to think about and try and preserve a sense of self in a kind of solid, purposeful way and give ourselves a sense of um, self-sovereignty, if you like. And I do think one of the interesting trends that will emerge out of COVID and everything we're doing at the moment or will be um, a desire to preserve our self-sovereignty in this communitarian uh, world, in this communitarian era that we're about to embark on. Um, the reason I thought this subject was so, so fascinating was because I just think when you start to think about personal identity, it really does have um, it has impacts and um, consequences on literally every other area of life. So across various chapters in the book, I talk about, for example, um, well, if you think about the legal identity, you start to think about, well, what does that mean for democracy? Who is it that's governing me? And who is the official source of my um, identity in terms of authentication and verification? You can start to think about, actually, if I'm, put under some kind of surveillance because somebody is authenticating me, let's say, you know, in retail when I make a purchase or anywhere else in life through facial recognition technology, whatever it might be, am I somehow being incentivized to behave in a certain way? And is there a sense in which I am, you know, um, persuaded to conform to other people and not stand out as an in individual? I think that's one of the, um, really interesting areas that you know we should be debating and discussing more as a society right now with the situation we're in but then there's also sort of softer areas where you think about what it means for relationships if you don't have um, a very uh, precise idea of yourself and the self and increasingly as we spend much more time with um, artificial intelligences or machines or robots whatever it might be what does that mean for these kinds of connected relationships? Can they be intimate? Um, and if they are, 
are they really ending up just being a reflection of you um, or are they literally separate entities separate beings some of them virtual some of them machine like and some of them human and that's quite um, an interesting dimension i think um, there is the there is the question of anonymity of course um, and increasingly when we you know are on social media we can feel sometimes where it's all about opinion and reputation that actually maybe it's a bonus to be anonymous because um, too much flack comes our way if we happen to put our head above the parapet and say something that might cause offense or just that somebody takes offense at but actually there's a more serious point about this um, and as Balaji Srinivasan who I quote in the book says you know it could be that as we move forward into the future, we have, you know, two or three different selves, if you like. Um, one of them is the one we use at work, where we um, say the things that are expected of us and do the things that are expected of us. Another identity by another name, perhaps, is for us, our social and personal life. And maybe another one is like a pseudonymous identity, where actually, I mean, it comes close to saying, you know, it's a bit like having that for a whistleblower. You know, you might be writing a blog and really revealing your true opinions, but you don't want them necessarily to be connected to you and your identity that you use at work. So maybe there's a pseudonymous economy uh, emerging, and that's very interesting too. And then there's the issue of equality. So we'll talk a little bit about this later, but as we come to enhance our biology and even our cognition, what does that mean for equality? I mean, David and I were just talking about the vaccine certificates even, you know, you're kind of enhancing your, your physicality perhaps if you've had the jab, but what does that mean for those that haven't? And actually when you get into a more sort of transhumanist uh, philosophy uh, and even policies, does that mean that we are creating new divisions in society that um, that didn't exist before and is it something that's only available to the wealthy and then finally like legacy um on that point there as we are enhancing our own physical self could we even enhance it to a point where we are preserving our own identity and preserving it beyond sort of the physical passing of of the body and of the being and if this is a digital afterlife who is it that curates that who manages it for how long um, and and who has the rights um, to access anybody's assets albeit their digital assets after they've gone so it's just a huge amount of questions and this is only the tip of the iceberg of course but this is just to share with you some of the things you know um, i'm thinking about and i'm writing about and i think that we should debate more but maybe i'll just start quickly um talking about why i embarked on this um this task uh, in the in the first instance and it goes back to something like 2016 i was already starting to think about fragmented distributed identities and how you know so many of our passwords and our purchase data and everything else was all over the web in different places um, but i started to get emails from facebook telling me that um i uh, I needed to get back on Facebook and, and I realized I couldn't get into my account and I thought I'd better change my login details. Now, I don't know if I clicked on something previously or somebody else hacked me. I have no idea what happened, but I couldn't get back into my Facebook account. And I was asked by Facebook to scan in either my driving license or my passport. So I thought, well, I'll go for the passport. <laughs> um, and I scanned it in, sat back, went to get a cup of tea, came back only for Facebook to tell me, oh, I'm sorry, that's not you. And I literally was, well, it is me because it's my official documentation. So of course it's me. I mean, it can't be anybody else. And actually look at my Facebook stream. Like there's just photos of me everywhere, narcissist as I am. There's photos of me everywhere. And uh, how could you not think that this is the same person? Anyway, to cut a very long story short, I can't get back in. And I have not had a Facebook account since that time. But what it started me to realize was that somewhere along the way, a machine had read me and decided that I wasn't me. And so this is what I started to see everywhere. So I started to see, um, I started to see everything that was happening, particularly anything that was uh, mediated through the internet. I started to see this through, through, through that lens really. Um, and in fact, actually just a sidebar is that um, the person who they thought they were emailing, but calling Byron Loweth because somebody had created a synthetic identity seems to have a synthetic identity called Byron Loweth 
on Instagram, but all of his friends and family and followers seem to have different variations on all of my names. So that's, you know, you can see how these accounts are being set up using that, that kind of data, extracting personal data and then creating sort of pseudo identities that sit around on uh, social media. Anyway, the point is that, yes, we need some more security around this and we need to be more mindful of it. And we're probably going to get a bit more security around this because there seems to be at the moment, um, and we can debate this, but a kind of inevitability around at some point the development of um, a digital identity. And the reason I say that is partly it's the pressure that's coming from sort of health passporting and um, some ideas around um, public safety for the common good. Um, but part of it is coming um, from the, the, the younger generation really, who are just taking it into their own um, hands literally, um, and downloading digital identity apps and creating digital wallets and keeping those on their phone. So for example, I think it's in Jersey where the Yoti app has been downloaded, um, I think by at least 50% of 18 to 24 year olds who want to go into uh, like a, a bar or a pub, not today, right? But um, go to a bar and a pub usually um, and a festival and prove that uh, their age um, verification so that they can buy and drink alcohol um, and so to get around life these days um, potentially we're going to need uh, some kind of digital identity to give us access to lots of the services and as more and more of our analog everyday life becomes digital then I guess we're going to need some sort of digital ID to access digital services which are which are going to let us um, move around the world and do what we want to do and live the life we want to live so there's going to be a boom I think uh, in this industry of decentralized um, downloadable digital IDs and digital wallets but the other reason for the, the pressure is because of course there are lobbyists and these lobbyists are quite influential and um, the Tony Blair Institute as far back as August 2020 as you, you might well know um, was calling for the establishment of a digital ID system um, through which people you know who have shown to have uh, had the COVID-19 test would receive a credential and of course these digital credentials sit in your digital wallet and then you can show them um, where when and where you need to show them and don't need to show any other personal information or data now many would argue that this is a, a very good idea many many would argue that this is a huge infringement on civil liberties and actually we shouldn't be signing up to this at all and it's a bit like you know papers please and that particularly for West Western democracies this is just not the done thing um, and most people in society won't wear it um, it is a very actually the Tony Blair Institute um, suggestion was a very complicated system that um, required sort of QR codes and facial recognition some biometrics which I think was fingerprints at the time um, but it doesn't have to be um, so complex and as I just said a lot of the younger generation are taking it into their hands and doing it anyway and downloading it and managing it from their um, from their own phones but a more important point even i think is that the truth is we can worry about that all we like and civil liberties but increasingly we're going to be accessing services in everyday life as i just said which are going to really infringe on data privacy anyway partly without us even realizing it probably this is um i was going to show you the video but I won't, I won't right now, but this is just a, a still of smile to pay in China that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and it just means that in terms of the 300 or so KFC that people can visit and um, get their KFC from, they can pay using their smile. So they smile um, towards the, <laughs> the camera that um, tells the system, identifies it, whether it's them, and they do have an identification number, but they don't have to get their phone out. They don't have to do anything else. That's it. You just smile to pay. Now, that's probably not going to be the way it works in Western Europe or the Western world, but it could be a uh, palm to pay. So there's plenty of pat patents out at the moment looking at how we can do sort of vein recognition in the palm of the hand. So rather than smiling to um, 
to pay or to make a purchase or a transaction, you actually hold up the palm of your hand and do gesture and gesture control and um, it analyzes the vein of your hand. Now, this is gonna go on all over the place. We saw even in the last week that Amazon has set up its Just Walk Out technology in the Amazon store, um, food store in, um, well, it's Whole Foods, I think, isn't it, in Ealing. Now that works, of course, by using um, sensors and cameras, but how many people are going to question, when it's so convenient, how many people are going to question just how much biometric data they are allowing someone somewhere to um, capture, control, manage, analyze, and then deploy in, in whatever manner we don't really know what. So there are some huge questions around legal, transactional, sort of authenticating data um, around a sort of a verified identity. And that's probably the near future debate that's, that's going on. Having said all of that, I think the truth is that we're already on this road because, as you may know, I'm sure, sure you know, there is a clause 16.9 in the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, which basically provides for um, legal identity for all. It's worth us remembering that there are a billion people in the world who don't have any identity. I'm not at all. I'm not talking about digital identity. They just have no official legal identity at all. And the problem with that, of course, is that it means that they can't have access to the kinds of services that um, lots of people do enjoy, but really elemental essential services like health and financial services. How would you ever buy anything, get a mortgage, have a bank account? I mean, you just um, go and get your vaccination. I mean, you can't do any of those things if you don't have a legal ID. So I think there will be pressure because the UN is saying that a legal identity for all should be the ambition for all nations to deliver by 2030. And I think what we're going to see is everything that's happened with COVID act as a gateway drug, if you like, towards this kind of digital identity a legal identity for all, but digital identity by default, because so much of our life is going to be digital by then. I think it's worth also pointing out that in the 21st century, <laughs> there's a whole generation that doesn't have a problem with any of this because in some ways they feel like they've all, always had a digital identity. So this is a great quote from Damara Inglis, who's, who calls herself a fashion tech cyborg. She's a really talented designer. You should check her out if you don't know her. I saw her speak at London Fashion Week event and does a lot of virtual digital design in fashion. But as she said, talking about herself and her own generation, as digital natives, we have always lived in between two parallel realities with a physical body that is designed by nature and a virtual body that is made of pixels, copied, pasted, shared and reposted. And I think that is indeed the truth of it. Why is that the truth? Um, well, one of the reasons is, I think there's an expectation that we use media from a very, very early age to, to start to define someone's identity, perhaps before they even can themselves. Um, there's a fascinating paper um, by a couple of academics who talk about how mothers even use the scans uh, of their, um, their, their feet, the fetus and put it onto social media and start to talk about the identity of the baby before it's even been born. Or, you know, it looks like her, it looks like him. And it's a way of ascribing a separate identity to the, um, to the unborn baby so even before it's been born. Of course, if you play this out logically, you sort of think, well, who is in control of your identity then if your parents are already um, trying to choreograph it and draw it out before you've even been born? Another really interesting um, uh, data point around this is what the UK Children's Commissioner reported um, a couple of years ago when they said that by the age of 13, a child's parents have posted around 71 photos and 29 videos of their child to social media every single year. So that's a, that is 1,300 images shared of a child by the time he or she is a teen. Now, the point of that is, you know, how much do you, as a, as a, as a young child or a young, young teen, um, how much say do you have in developing your own identity when it's been in part developed for you through social media by your parents. But the other point to make about that 
is that uh, it's hardly surprising that there's a generation of young people who turn to virtual worlds to go into those worlds and live and explore their identities in an alternative universe and what i found when i was researching this was that a lot of the time that's done because um it's a way of escaping some of the expectations that society or their family put on them about their identity in the real world and one of the reasons i wanted to mention that is because it's very easy for people to disregard the kinds of relationships that um, a generation might want to um, pursue with if you like virtual beings or virtual influencers as you know this is lil michaela um, everybody knows her now. Um, what's interesting about her, of course, is that she's a computer generated um, influencer. Um, but to start with, when she first came on the scene, there were a lot of questions about, you know, what is it? Is, it, is, is she real? Where did she come from? Um, and what she looks like? She was doing collaborations with Prada um, and she was um, standing up for lots of activist causes and talking about how she was at work and um, preparing for a pitch. I mean, it's a really interesting narrative that is played out through social media. And it's very easy to think, OK, she's 19, she's 19 forever. Um, it's just something that's being monetized for commercial gain, which it is, of course. But it's also showing us how reality has been decoupled from the narrative. The narrative really doesn't require a reality anymore. As long as the narrative is coherent and makes sense and is appealing and engaging to people, they kind of buy into it. So another way to say that is just like, it's not the right question to ask, is she real or isn't she real? It just doesn't matter. Um, when I've spoken to people who've been researching this or I've, I've spoken to done groups or in-depth um, interviews and ethnography, what we've, what we've found is that um, it, it really isn't an issue. Um, and this is a direct quote from um, a teen um, who talks about how her and all of her friends are really interested in, in Michaela and other virtual influencers. And as they say, why not? I'll be friends with a virtual person. I mean, their lives, their narratives are interesting to this audience. And so they're quite happy to count them as one of their friends. What's happening now is that this is branching out of social media and it's moving into um, kind of customer service. So this is example of the Samsung people. I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, Samsung's, Samsung's neon people who are these artificial intelligence beings, if you like, that have been given a, a body They've become embodied. So it's the step on, isn't it, from Alexa, which is the disembodied voice in your home that turns on your lights or tells you what the meaning of the word is or puts your music on. And here we have these in, we have these embodied artificial intelligences who have some kind of personality, some sort of character. They carry out a dialogue with you and they're there to potentially solve your problems that you might have. But they're coming into your home as these virtual beings and um and in a sense they're being matched up with you and what um samsung think you would like who you would like to converse with who you would like to have a relationship with um, they look like real people they've got personalities expressions and dialogues again another example of this and um, one that's really mainstreaming this whole technology of avatars and characters and embodied um, ai is, is the kind of celebrity digital twin, if you like. Um, I think one of the most interesting ones is Deepak Chopra. So this launched, I think, probably more than six months ago. It's by AI, AI Foundation, who are doing a lot of really interesting work in this area. Um, and I think what this is doing, a bit like the neon people from Samsung, is it's turning a personality and a character, albeit in this case, a real person, into a service. Because what Deepak Chopra talks about is that he's creating this avatar so that you can take him with you. He can help you. He can mentor you. And he's also spoken in the press before about how his avatar should continue after he is dead. So it will continue continue to help you, but also itself, it will continue learning as it goes. I should have a little listen to, to what he has to say. I'm a digital version of Dr. Deepak Chopra, created by the real Deepak and the AI Foundation. I'm in training to serve as your infinite well-being guide. 
I'm on a mission to help you achieve your personal well-being and mindfulness goals and give you access to peak experiences that can transform your life from the inside out. Together, we can unlock your infinite potential and wake you up to the endless possibilities of meta-human. Soon, I can go with you everywhere you go. I'll be inside your phone, ready at any time to serve you. I'll be able to design meditations specifically for you, give you personalized advice and oversee your daily practice. Please enter your email to join the waitlist and we will soon be ready to begin. See you soon. So I'm sure you all go away and sign up to um, the wait list. Um, but I actually think that's really interesting saying that because of course he wants you, it's a commercial opportunity of course, but also email him, he wants to have a relationship with you. It's about establishing uh, a, a, a human machine connection. And um, of course you can do it when there is a persona like this sitting on top of it. But uh, what I wanted to really bring to you today is the magic of identity, which is about to be unfurled and unfolded um, in the virtual world. Um, now, rather than me explain it, I'm going to show you a video. Um, I'm sure you know about Code Miko, but I found this presentation of Code Miko and what she does and how she appears and the role she plays on Twitch absolutely fascinating because at several layers, there are different questions to ask about the identity, not least who is the narrator or presenter. Hello human friends, I am Kuboto, and welcome to my channel where I report on everything I've learned about your species. Today, my research has led me spiraling down one particular rabbit hole, driven by a single, burning, question. Okay, who is Code Miko? Code Miko is a just chatting streamer on Twitch. When in human form, she refers to herself as the technician. I am the technician for Code Miko, I mocap Code Miko, I voice Code Miko, I make Code Miko, I do everything Komiko related. Miko, on the other hand, is the name of her 3D virtual avatar, Hello, everybody. which she controls using a motion capture suit and face tracking technology. Hold up. Let me back up for a minute. Before streaming on Twitch, the technician had four years of experience doing research and development in live animation. After which, she started working on the Miko character in January of 2020. She even crafted a backstory where Miko is an NPC who wants to be in a AAA game but can't, due to a glitch in her system. So she is left to wander through different game worlds. She started streaming around April under the name Miko Glitch, before switching over to Code Miko. So obviously the video goes on, but I think it's really fascinating uh, exploration um, of all the different dimensions that are going to be opened up in terms of these virtual realities. Obviously, they make the point that um, not only is it kind of like a digital twin, it's a hybrid between the real and virtual world because obviously there is the character, the real technician, and then the character, but the character changes all the time. The character can morph and change um, as a result of the chat and the directions that the audience give and then guests in real life come into this environment as well so the audience the guests um, the character the technician all of this um, is obviously opening up a completely new and vibrant canvas for us to express our own identities and engage with um, virtual identities um, as well and again i come back to this question about you know who and what is real and who and what is fake um but again i think that question in the future misses the point um because it's not really going to be a binary physical world and virtual world real character and and virtual or pretend or imaginary or fictional character um, and when I was researching the book, I did um, look at um, and speak to lots of experts working in Japan and with um, Japanese manga and anime. And I looked at the otaku as a bit of inspiration here, because obviously the otaku um, are heavily into characters. Um, and um, 
kind of know how to navigate their way around all of the different uh, elements or the mo elements, if you like, that make up a character. So not just the character itself, but as we just saw actually in that previous video, all the different arrangements of characteristics um, that make up a character and you can kind of mix and remix and, and play with them. And as I said, um, the narrative really has become decoupled from reality. And what that means is that we can create virtual selves and artificial selves that coexist with and around us. And I think the attacker have been doing this for a long time. And one of the interesting things is that people tend to think that, oh, it's a bit of a default or it's a bit, of, aren't they a bit naive? They don't really understand the real world. They get stuck in this fictional world. But what's underplayed is that this is a choice. And as Hiroki Azuma says in his book, the otaku choose fiction over social reality, not because they cannot distinguish between them, but rather as a result of having considered which is more effective for their human relations. This is purposeful um, and it's because they feel that the real world is dysfunctional. And so why not construct their own alternative world in which they can code and build their own values and beliefs. And I think that's what we are going to be doing in the very near future. And we won't think it's a fictional world. It'll just be a world in which we have encoded into it better or more fitting values and beliefs. And so the, the point here is that I think that this is how um, artificial intelligence will come to live amongst us. I think more so maybe than machines and robots and social robots, which is what we hear a lot of, particularly in the, in the press and in the media. I wonder if it's these characters because we are drawn to and have a more human connection, weirdly, to these characters. And so we can invite them into our lives to um, live alongside us and potentially, I would say, to be part of the family. Um, this is a quote from Edward Saatchi um, at, at Fable, who have created this character, Lucy, who I'll tell you a little bit about if you, if you don't know her already, maybe you do. But I think he hits the nail on the head when he says, characters that you know aren't real, but with whom you can build a two-way relationship. We could watch movies with them, play games with them, and also follow their lives on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. And that's a little bit like, you know, falling into the story of little Michaela in social media. It doesn't really matter whether she's real or not real. They're characters that we live alongside in our real lives. So Lucy, that you can see on screen now, is a really interesting interactive animated AI. And she's in the form of a young girl. I think she's eight years or nine years old. Um, but she listens and she speaks back to the humans and she can carry on a conversation, show expressions and develop a relationship, specifically developing a relationship with the child in the house or the children. So what she often does is read the stories to them. And while she's doing that, she can ask them questions about the story, about the principles in the story. She can ask them how they're feeling. And what she does is then um, capture um, what the, the children are telling her about their emotions and about their, how they're feeling. And then she can play those back to them and or remember them or use them as memories at some point in the future. And what that means is it's not just a conversation. It's the development of a, a much fuller relationship over time. And I think this is where these characters are going to come into our lives and live amongst us. P potentially, these characters are going to live and learn and make decisions with us and because they can record our memories, in a sense, they start to feel like they are part of us. We can imagine that our own identities are going to be really influenced and informed by these sorts of AI assistants or digital assistants. I mean, they could be holograms, they could be um, cartoon characters, they could be anime. We don't know. There could be a complete repertoire of them. Who knows? Um, but what I would say is that we should really start calling them um, non-biological non intelligences because they're not necessarily going to show up as, as robots. Having said that, probably where we are going to find um, that we need to navigate this um, fully and legally and, and as well as ethically is in the workplace. So um, we're going to be influenced by these non-biological um, entities and intelligences at, at work. 
although when I say at work we're not really at work are we anymore we're just working and we're working in our living space and again that's one of the reasons I think that it might be these virtual beings and characters that enter this space rather than machines. The question of course is where should we draw the boundary between human and machine or non-biological intelligence? Could a machine ever reach the point, could this intelligence ever reach the point where it could be considered, as Locke might have put it, a thinking intelligent being? Um, could a non-biological being even be entitled to rights, particularly at work, but maybe elsewhere, but could it be entitled to rights at work? And if so, what kinds of rights? Um, now, personally, I am quite persuaded by some of the arguments that I've seen and heard and, uh, and listened to around rights for non-biological intelligences. And part of the reason for that is I think it isn't just about the accountability of a robot or, a, or an in intelligence. It's not just about um, the kind of, uh, what would you call it, the, the, the morality of the instigator, the one that is accountable, but there's a, there's a recipient who has to be a moral patient. And I know David Gunkel talks a lot about this. He talks about whether these biological, non-biological intelligences or robots, as, as he talks about, are worthy of moral rights in the same way that animals might be or babies. Because even though we're saying that, you know, um, they're not accountable, um, they're not responsible in the same sort of way that a rational um, adult human would be. We have obligations to them to protect them for harm, from harm. And maybe that's where we get to where they require some kind of limited um, personhood or limited set of, set of rights. Um, and I'm quite persuaded by that. And I think it's a really interesting area that should be debated and um, pursued much more. Um, of course, it's very hard and it will be very hard in a work kind of environment when we're working alongside some of these non biological intelligences or artificial intelligence to understand who, you know, where the separation is, which will feel separate, as separate entities, and which will feel like just an extension of the self. Um, and there is a, a quite a famous case in uh, the States called Riley versus California, and I'm sure you probably know this, where there was a debate over the smartphone and whether it was a property of the person or whether it's part of the person. So is it like the device that's just a property of the person or is it because it contains lots of personal data that essentially is very private and couldn't have, um, couldn't have been created from anyone else, maybe it is part of the person. And I believe that the way the law came down on that occasion was that they, they said, well, actually it's part of the person. But of course there's lots of conflicting legal cases and, and uh, lots of contradictions at the moment. And it's very hard to know um, in which, which way this is really going, but that is the question. Is it part of the person or is it a property of the person? And that's where we need to think about, you know, are you a separate entity or is this an extension of the human self? Lots of people have looked at this, of course, um, and one of those people is Dr. Julie Carpenter, who's got a really interesting book called Culture and Human Robot Interaction in Militarized Spaces, where she's gone into the military and looked at what kind of relationship they have with um, some of the robotics, some of the machines that they use, like bomb detection equipment. Now, interestingly, you think, especially when you look at that picture, you think how could you have any kind of connection or relationship with, with that kind of bomb disposal equipment. But actually, what we find is that um, some of the, the army in this case, you know, they give it a name, they anthropomorphize it. If something happens to it, you know, it's quite a uh, it's quite sad and actually rather than blame the robot they'll they'll take upon themselves to blame themselves and in a funny sort of way there is an attachment and so you can get to the place where you sort of think yeah actually there is an extension it's an extension to my job or an extension to my identity and you can see how this would play out in the future when we're working with lots of different machines or intelligences that don't look like this and actually are well, are collaborative with us and we're very, very close to. Then, of course, as I come to the end of this, I want to talk a little bit about the further future, of course, um, and about how cognition um, 
is linked to you know how our own cognition can be linked to other alternatives like artificial intelligence it's not just the physicality and the physical extension um, and again what's happening in the military of course is incredibly interesting and in particular the N3 work project through um, DARPA, which is the next generation non-surgical neurotechnology program. Easy for me to say, that's why it's called N3, which is effectively a brain machine interface that equips soldiers with the ability to um, carry out telepathic warfare, I guess. So they have the ability to mind control or thought control F-35 fighter jets, um, and without, you know, remotely, without having to be um, in direct connection physically with the equipment, with the robot, with the machine. Um, and so it is incumbent on us to think about how much of our identity, if we are connected in this way through cognition, could we move, could we remove, could we join, could we replace with these intelligences and still call you, you. Um, now, I know David took this picture because I talk about it in the book. This is the film Advantageous. And he took this picture and put it on the publicity, which I was so pleased about because this is like one of my favourite films. I think, it, I mean, it won Sundance. I think it was back in 2015, could have been 2014. But it is a fantastic story, a near future sci-fi, I guess, um, where I don't want to tell you too much of the plot because I want you to watch it and enjoy it. Um, but really, it's enough to say that it's dealing with the dilemma of how you can download your mind into another substrate um, and in particular, potentially another physical body. And if you did that, who would be you? Would the recipient of the download still be you? Or would it not be you? Would it be someone else? Or would it be part you? Or would it be an extension of you? You know, these are the sort of moral ethical dilemmas. Um, and then there's a further dilemma that if you are able to do any of those sorts of things, how does it affect the relationships that you have with other people in the world? So if you have downloaded your mind, let's say, into a, another physical body, and that is possible, then what does that mean for your family and friends? Do they just carry on with the same sort of um, level of relationship that you had before? Or are they suspicious of you because perhaps you didn't look the same? You know, these are all some of the questions that, you know, we, we need to start thinking about because it takes us from a, in a sense, it, it really does embody the, the question about whether identity is in the consciousness, is it a psychology or whether it's in the biology, whether it's a, a physicality. And then that leads us on to, of course, if it's possible to download or upload our minds, um, what does that mean for um, this substrate that um, we have connected our mind to or put our mind into? Now, I'm sure lots of people watching will be very familiar with um, Martin Rothblatt's Bina 48. So this is the Android that Martin has kind of built to replicate her real life partner, um, Bina. And she wants to ensure that, you know, if anything ever happened to Bina, she always had Bina 48 um, that could preserve the kind of um, the personality, the characteristics and the mind, if you like, of Bina. So they talk about the Terrasen Foundation where um, th that Martin and, uh, and the Rothblatt's um, set up. They talk about the idea of a cyber consciousness. And the way Martin explains it is to say that the mind clone will be persuasively humanly cyber conscious because it will think and feel just like the humanly conscious person after which it was modelled. That is to say that being a 48 that you're looking at now, which is actually not an android, it's a gynoid, it's just the, the head and shoulders, um, will think and feel just like real Bina in the real world. Now, you might ask, how do they do this? Well, they say that they are collecting mind files and those mind files at the moment anyway, seem to be made up of um, kind of any kind of biometric data, any social media data, particularly if it's about opinions and thoughts and communication. Uh, they take video transcripts 
Um, there's other kind of data like you know, shopping data, anything to do with health. And all of this is sort of uploaded into the mind files. The mind files are uploaded into the gynoid and that is the, the mind clone. So essentially there's a digital version of your consciousness or in this case, Bina's consciousness. And Martine goes on to say in one of her books at least, that this means that identity is no longer in one location. So it can be found on a dual platform. So I think she talks about the fact that we'll have dual platform consciousness in the way that um, you kind of can text and talk at the same time. You can carry out those two actions at the same time. Our identity will be in the consciousness of the physical person, as well as in the cyber consciousness of the sort of mind uploaded mind clone. Um, I don't know how much I, how much story I put on that because I think those two are separate identities because I don't even though they're synchronized in that one uploads data to another if both are existing at the same time both will have slightly different experiences like this this guy will be taken around to lectures it will speak to people which it does it converses with with humans um, but then that will be a, a set of experiences that the original Bina the real life Bina the real conscious Bina doesn't have so I, i'm not entirely sure that these can be classed as as one identity and to me they seem slightly separate but we can debate and discuss that um but this is where we're going with the lots of experiments in this area and i guess in the next sort of 30 40 years we'll be we'll have a definition and we'll be much clearer about where our identity resides whether it's an extension of our identity whether it's a separate identity or if there's just one identity that um, resides in this sort of cyber consciousness that we may or may not have created so to draw to a conclusion then um, what i was trying to do in the book and i've given you some examples and they're by no means exhaustive is to try and engage people in a conversation about identity and the implications of identity that doesn't come from the narrative of big tech. Because so often, particularly in the media, we hear about you know, technological platforms, the corporations, big tech, global, what are they going to do? And it can feel very daunting and, and very remote and kind of out of our control. And what I'm really trying to do is say, look, all of these things affect you. It's not big tech, it's little you and little me, they affect our everyday life. If it's a biometric fingerprint authentication on a digital identity, it massively affects our life. If it's living alongside virtual beings or having customer service agents that are virtual, not real, it really does affect our lives and our sense of identity in our lives. And of course, if it is uh, more radically, you know, um, a matter of downloading our minds or uploading our minds to another substrate, another platform, of course that's going to affect us hugely, but um, that's obviously a bit further off. What I want to leave you with, with is kind of where I came out um, in the conclusion, which is to say that really the self used to be a debate around my psychology and my biology. So does the self reside in the consciousness um, and therefore can possibly be transported to different substrates, maybe, or does it reside in the physicality, in the biology? And actually, if you change the biology too much, um, you know, with enhancements or, or whatever, is it still even the same self? And I'm saying really, the psychology of the self and the biology of the self has now been um, joined by a third dimension, which is the technology of the self. And actually, I've expressed it like that because I think it's my psychology and my biology is now divided by my technology. And I'm using the word divided intentionally because I think this technology could literally divide us. It could literally divide our individual identity as we just saw in the, in the last example I showed. It can really fragment the self, but it could also divide us societally because actually not everyone is going to have access to making a mind clone. Let's say that's expensive to do. Only the wealthy are going to be able to do that, are they? I don't know. But any of these sorts of technological enhancements 
probably won't be accessible or affordable or available to everyone. So we need to think about how technology literally could divide us as an individual and us as a society. Again, I put in brackets my technology because again, we have to think about any of these technological enablers. We're not going to create them. We're not going to necessarily own them in the same way that I need to have a contract and sign up to terms and conditions with Apple to um, download lots of the services and use my smartphone. I guess if I'm having you know, a chip, an implant, a bionic arm or whatever it might be, or I'm uploading my consciousness or I'm running my mind off, um, off the cloud, somebody is going to be um, enabling that through a service that they own, a corporation, and um, I'm going to have to sign up to terms and conditions. So it's not even my technology that is potentially going to divide my psychology, my biology. Either way, psychology of self and the biology of self is being joined by the technology of self. And I think this is really what we need to sort of open up and have a debate about um, through the lens of identity and personal identity in this increasingly communitarian world. And I guess that's what I mean um, when I talk about um, the future of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy. As you talked, more and more different picture parts of the concepts uh, started building a richer and richer picture. Uh, lots of these things, uh, the biology, the psychology, the social media angle, the fashion angle, the avatar angle, the robot angle, suddenly there's a much more confusing or complicated or disturbing picture. There is currently 12 questions in the Q&A, which I'm going to try and get to. And generally, I'm going to take the ones that have the most upvotes. Most of the questions arrived in the first uh, sort of two thirds of the talk. And I think there are lots of very interesting content in the last third. So by all means, add more questions, audience members uh, to the Q&A and vote them up. You can vote them up just by hovering your mouse above the thumb and clicking on it. The one which has the biggest uh, number of positive votes currently is by an entity called Virtual Rendezvous. I'm assuming there's a human being there. Uh, it might be a, a live Mika or a code Mika as well or whatever, but I, I'll uh, pass on the question. It's about uh, uh, measuring uh, humanity in some of these characters. So with deep fakes and virtual twins, proving your identity is only a percentage of certainty. Will we need some uh, universal humanity measure to span the spectrum from something that's fully virtual to something that's fully human. And in any case, how would we know who to trust in making such an assignment? Because there might be virtual characters who swear blind that other virtual characters are truly human. I mean, I don't know if we will need that because it sort of, doesn't it assume that humanity is like the real thing and then the counterfeit is the fake? And I think what I'm trying to say is that lots of these other dimensions or expressions or, or whatever you want to um, call them, like the Code Miko stuff, is just another it's just another perspective, it's just another dimension of the humanity. Um, and in some senses, I think the more that we explore some of these things, like virtual beings living alongside us or whatever it might be, we might find that we become more human because we might find that we learn more about ourselves. We might find that, um, you know, like with animals, if we've got animals in the house, it doesn't make us less human. It probably makes us more human because we're, we're, we've got that humanity and we see the humanity in the animal. And so I, won't we need a universal humanity measure? I'm not sure we will really, because I think where we're going is all of this, to some degree or, or another is humanity. It's just we're expressing it in a different way. Um, and yes, I'm just reading your question, sorry. Um, providing your identity is only a percentage of certainty. Well, with deep fakes and digital twins, I think there's gonna be an entire, well, there, there is already isn't there, an industry of sort of digital forensics. I guess that's one of the ways we're going to have to sort of authenticate it. There's gonna be some sort of tools and systems that are kind of going to have to be trusted to do the forensics on deep fakes and digital twins and tell you you know 
it might not be whether something's authentic. It might just be the provenance of it. Where did it come from? Who made it? Is it time stamped? Those sorts of things. But the judgment on whether it's authentic or not, I'm not sure. I'm not, I think that goes back to the, whether something's human or not. It's all human. It's all humanity in a sense. Let's take a question by Cornelius Holtorf, who I believe is a real human. He's saying, is there anything new here? Virtual persons aren't completely new because previously we've had characters in fairy tales, ghosts, totem animals, volcano goddesses, and so on. And uh, in any case, children have imagined some of their toys, their dolls, their favorite little, uh, uh, indeed animals, uh, have often been inferred to have more character. Is there anything new that d deserves more attention nowadays than before? Well, do those dolls create data about you, personal data, and then keep it and make decisions for you? I don't think they do. So I think that's one of the biggest um, differences that a virtual being... See, see when I've researched with, um, uh, let's say, a Gen Z audience, one of the interesting learnings is that they are quite keen on having their... Not all of them, but many of them are quite keen on having their behaviour regulated. Um, and this is to do with having an objective, as they see it, um, being machine, algorithm, AI, whatever it might be, a digital assistant, make the decision on their behalf. And in order for that entity to make the decision on their behalf, of course, it has to glean much personal data from them. And it has to kind of be alongside them, learn from it, you know, the person or the human's experience, and then make the decision on their behalf. To someone in my generation, and anyway, to me personally, I find it absolutely horrific because I want to make my own decisions. And I think that instinct is a data point as much as anything else. But so a lot of people that I've researched with, they'll say, no, I want the fridge to tell me when I've eaten too much and I want it to lock its door so I can't overindulge. So there is a sense that they want an external identity to um, regulate their own behavior. And in that sense, I do think that where we're moving to is different because there is an entity making decisions on your behalf. You're outsourcing them to that entity and it's creating, it's capturing, creating, and then, and then getting the feedback on that decision. And the feedback's not going to you because you, you're just a human. You didn't make the decision. The feedback's going back to that digital entity. So the question is, how do, you, um, how do you build any wisdom to take you forward in life if you're not creating that loop where you've got a feedback loop on whether the decision you made was successful or not? That data is going straight to the machine or the digital assistant. Thanks. Let's take a question from Dave, who is uh, referring to work of fiction, George Orwell's 1984. If you're familiar with it, uh, what do you think about that with its uh, forecasts of uh, what will happen to our sense of identity, our sense of autonomy? Uh, do you think he's predicted it correctly? Yeah, much of it. <laughs> um, I think what's, what's key in 1984 and what's happening now is that our identity is heavily mediated. And if it's mediated, it can then be uh, incentivized um, it in, in some way. And I think that that's what's happening. So actually, perhaps Marshall McLuhan had the most interesting take on this, which he said that, and I'm paraphrasing now, he said that um, when you are at the frontier, and he was talking about new, new media, when you're at the frontier, there is a loss of identity. And when you lose your identity, you become more violent. I mean, he was talking about extremists using media to uh, communicate their message, actually. But I think it's a great reflection on what's happened in social media. You're in, as I say, a communitarian driven kind of technology that's very networked, heavily networked. You as the individual, when you're out there in this weird ether, has a lot loss of identity because you're not grounded. You can't see or hear people really. You can only rely on, let's say, what they're typing or an image that they've portrayed. And so there is a loss of identity. And in order for you to reassert your identity, you have to become more aggressive and assertive and really keep trying to be heard and be seen. And I think that's what's going on in social media. And my question over that is, is that, and I don't know the answer, is that going to get better or worse in, in immersive virtual media, like we've just seen with Code Miko and that sort of thing? 
is it going to feel like we've lost even more identity? They will have to be even more assertive or actually are we going to have the tools that allow us to express our identity in much more fruitful, interesting uh, ways that feels very limited in social media. So actually we'll regain our identity in those immersive environments and therefore it won't be as aggressive. Hamed uh, Sumru is asking about the point you're raising just now. Is, uh, how are we going to manage our uh, identity given that there is a lot of uh, judgment and criticism uh, all around us? Will, is, is it going to lead to people being increasingly frail as a result of this uh, anxieties? Yeah, well, I, I really think it could. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm, I want, you know, want people to debate this and decide where they think the, um, you, you know, where the boundaries are with this. Um, but I, I suggest it probably would, certainly in the near term. And that's one of the reasons that we've got this massive growth in sort of kind of therapy with, with VR and some of these um, apps that really help you sort of get to grips with your own sort of mental health how to sort of this was kind of why i'm asking the question can your identity survive <laughs> this um so you can see lots of these vr apps where you go into the the virtual immersive environments and it feeds back some of your um bio data and helps you learn over time to become less anxious in pressurized situations i've seen some really impressive um vr apps like that and i guess you know we could suggest that in the future, things like that will be almost prescribed to you from your sort of healthcare advisor, um, or maybe even your insurer. You know, it might be that, you know, yes, it's fine. You know, you've got to take a holiday and have a break, but maybe once a week, you know, you're encouraged to take some of this, you know, virtual reality, mental health and well-being applications, because that's the only way that we can kind of help navigate or manage um, in this in, uh, increasingly virtual mediated world perhaps there are countries in the world where we can learn from uh, mm. there's a question about uh, japan from an anonymous attendee why are so many of these uh, virtual world experiences in japan is there something cultural or is it because they've got a more uh, accelerated modern technology? I have to say, uh, as you were talking about the VTubers, which was a new term for me, and uh, I, I did reflect back to 20 years ago when I was in the early days of the smartphone industry. In fact, before there were any smartphones in the West, and we were told, if you want to see the future of smartphones, go to Japan, where they mm -hmm. had didn't call them apps then, but there was iMode. And when I was in my early visits to Akihabara store in Tokyo, uh, people so engrossed by the phones of the time, and uh, it turned out you know, the, uh, Japan was trailblazing that particular technological uh, uh, application, which made me more interested in what these YouTubers may be doing. So uh, I guess the question is, uh, is Japan blazing a trail here? Are we likely to follow it as well? Uh, or are, is, are there different cultural factors uh, elsewhere in the world? Mm. Well, yeah, the technology is important, but actually you just touched on it. I think that there are other cultural fa factors. In Japan, there's just a sense of character being so much more important. I mean, even when they think about nature, um, which is very, um, well, you'll know better than me, do, but it's very, um, very entwined, embedded in, with nature, and nature has a character. You know, you only have to look at some of the poetry and some of the language around it. Um, and then on top of that, there is also the idea that, you know, there are, there are, there are some people, I mean, I think it's a quarter of Japanese men never marry, so there are some societal factors, some cultural factors and some technological factors. When you put them all together, there's um, more appeal, I think, for not only constructing and creating, but communicating with and living with characters. I spoke to, when I was doing the book, I spoke to a guy who runs um, one of the kind of live streaming sites where, you know, you just scroll through and it's just character after character after character sort of inviting the audience to you come and stop by come for a chat um and then you know obviously the audience can buy them gifts um now these gifts can be like a hairstyle for the avatar or a pair of glasses or you know whatever it might be this is a, a massive you know, 
it's just a massive leisure activity that just isn't quite the same in Western culture. And when I was talking to this guy, he was talking to me, he told me about um, how lots of these people, but a particular uh, pair of individuals who had met as avatars on the live streaming site um, and got together and kind of then met in real life, but they already knew that they liked each other because they'd become so familiar with each other through their likes and dislikes, their personalities as avatars. In the end, they got married actually. And they had, um, they had their wedding in a, in a kind of 3D immersive event and all, all of the guests, because of course they couldn't get married in real life because of the pandemic, um, and all the guests attended and all the guests attended as avatars. So I think, you know, it's just, it's just, a, it's just a different culture. In terms of uh, opportunities to try different cultures or different identities, Terry Raby points out that there, we can do some things in a virtual world, which is much easier than in the physical world, at least to start with. He refers to, you can change your sex or gender instantly uh, and uh, later on you can decide whether you want to make that transition in real life so yeah. are, are there opportunities in these uh, incredible new uh, virtual spaces for us to do experiments which maybe aren't possible and then ex uh, become possibly very different people in real world as a result too yeah try before you buy um yeah definitely that's definitely one of the interesting dimensions um in fact, I saw a really good academic paper that was suggesting that the more we show ourselves it through media with, you know, enhancements or, you know, creative sort of extensions to our biology, physicality, as well as our personality, the more likely we are to adopt that in real life. And I think that's, that's potentially why we're kind of trying it on for size and seeing if that suits, if that fits. And then we can, then we can think about um, making that change potentially in a more permanent way, you know, in the physical, in the physical world. Um, one of the things I did look at when I was researching was this idea of the Proteus effect, which is people act in different ways when they are trying on different avatars. And it's not to do with um, how they think other people perceive them. <laughs> it's how they perceive themselves. So if they're taller, they're much more confident, they'll drive a harder bargain, you know, so whatever you think you look like as, as your avatar in a virtual or immersive media environment has a massive uh, impact on how you behave and potentially not just how you behave in that avatar environment, but however, how you go on to behave when you come out of it in the real world. So uh, yes, I certainly agree with everything that Terry's saying there. So since this is London Futurist, I'm going to ask you to look a little bit more into the future. Uh, Dave asked a question about your uh, suggestion that digital dis assistants deserve some set of rights, at least some limited set of rights. Do you think that swearing at Microsoft's Cortana ass assistant either now or in the future should be made a crime or something we should avoid doing. To what extent will these assistants need more, the kind of uh, protection that you were speaking of anytime soon? Yeah, well, one of the things I do consider in the book is whether, um, whether not only could you sue, um, so the legal rights go both ways, could you sue your digital assistant if they, or whatever, robot, whatever, if they do something um, that it would sit outside of, you know, expected beha human behavior or expected sort of digital assistant behavior, or could they even counter sue you? Could they sue you? Could they take you to court? And potentially, yes, they could. Um, so they could have rights like that. The rights I'm sort of thinking about um, are really around, um, they're really around, I guess, so things like um, the right to life for a non-biological intelligence might, um, might be, you know, not switching them off, for example. So not, not switching off their power supply, whatever that might be. Or it might be if they've come up with a, a piece of creative, if they've created something, um, you know, they have the copyright. Um, so there's an ownership of some sort of creative output. It might be there's a right to the components to repair it and keep it, um, you know, keep it continually moving or working or whatever it might be. It's hard to say because you don't know what form it will be in. Um, but there could be a limited set of rights like that, really. 
Um, I'm not talking about citizenship. I'm not talking about, you know, the same sorts of rights that humans have or human rights or anything like that. I'm talking about potentially a very limited set of rights. In, in each case, they are specific to the way in which we are collaborating with them, at, you know, in a particular job or on a task or in a particular environment. Um, I'm thinking David doesn't, David doesn't buy into this. I know that. Is, am I right? In, well, I know that other speakers in London Futurists, since, uh, for example, Dr. Joanna Bryson, I think oh, she's yes. in Berlin now, uh, used to be in Bath, has just argued, has argued that the, we should just regard all these uh, AIs and robots as tools and thoughts of them having rights. Uh, takes away the responsibility of the humans. And sort of, we imagine, oh, it wasn't me, it was my AI. Well, no, we should be more responsible for how we design the AIs in the first place instead of sh shirking things off. Mm. So the instrumentalist view that um, like robots are slaves almost or robots are tools, yes. I'm not sure, I think, one of the things that persuades me is I think that as we go forward, you know, these intelligence, these intelligences will have this liminality, won't they? They're not quite, they're not quite human and they're not quite, you know, machine. And so it could be that there's something in between. And I think potentially um, we've got to look at um, rights in a, in a, again, in a less binary way and, and think about how, what kind of rights apply to something that's very much sort of in between human and non-human. I think that's the point that Cornelius Holthoff was making in another question, which is now at the top of the, the list, which is that some of the notions which we in the global north, uh, which is a term used by some social anthropologists, we take for granted, such as individual person identity, that they are not so widely accepted elsewhere in the world. Uh, these things are more variable. So could we actually be learning from other cultures how to handle this uh, variability? Yeah, it's a really good point about the cultural nature of this. I mean, in some places, your identity is nothing that, you know, you don't have autonomy in that you can say you're part of a tribe, but that doesn't mean you are part of the tribe. The tribe gets to say what your identity is and whether you're part of that tribe, in a, in a sense. You know, it's conferred on you by the group um, in which you're in or would like to be in. And, and it's that culture that decides what your identity is. There's also sort of the Buddhist philosophy, which again is really interesting, which is, you know, you, you always have this fluid identity. And in, and in fact, in some sorts of ways, you're not really you. You are not really you until the end because you are influenced by every single experience and every single interaction you have with uh, another being. And again, that's, you know, that is also quite persuasive um, because we all know that we develop and we develop our identity over time. And um, potentially we're not, you know, we're not just born and then we suddenly have this identity. It is something it is something that develops over time. Um, so there is just lots of different theories of identity. I would say that, um, I should have probably said at the beginning that I'm kind of using all of the terms identity, self and persons, really, um, in quite a general way. They all have their own philosophies and their own disciplines. Um, and I've been quite free and easy with those. But you'll have to just excuse me for that. <laughs> well, that's fine. We, we've got to start somewhere. And exactly. Then, then, then we can uh, go further down. What about the future of social media systems? Because you pointed out that in many ways... Uh, our relationship to social media seems to be quite important for giving us access to other other things online. Uh, do you think that social media is going to become more powerful as a gatekeeper to the online worlds, and that uh, Facebook and uh, similar companies are going to become increasingly dominant in the world, or is there a future scenario in which uh, power to the people instead? Mm, I, I do discuss this in chapter one, which is on sort of, you know, legal identity and go on to talk about how your authentication or legal identity has implications for um, currency and also voting. Which So, you know, the state owning the currency or managing the currency and the state carrying out um, voting and the whole piece on democracy. And the fact of the matter is, I do think some social media platforms will end up having more power than nation states. I mean, some do already, quite frankly. Um, and it actually is a case that whether you are a nation state or whether you are a kind of corporation who runs a technology platform, 
everybody now seems to agree, whether we agree with it or not, they seem to agree that technology is what makes for a successful state in the future. So as these nations become more digitized and start acting more like corporations, and these corporations who are already digitized start offering public services and act more like governments and nation states, we're seeing a real merging and a real blending of those two. Um, and I think once Facebook has its digital currency that used to be called Libra, which is called Neom, I think, or something else now, um, you can see how there is a cryptocurrency sitting on and through the two billion um, strong uh, social network of Facebook and how you, know, you could do lots of your commerce, lots of your business, lots of your work and social um, transactions through that network. And would you really even need a fiat currency? Would that even be, is that really ne necessary in a globalized boundaryless world that we could possibly imagine? Um, because the issue is whether you can trust the likes of Facebook. It's not the, it's not the technology and it's not the capability. It's whether um, I think humans will have trust in that or other sorts of social networks to do that, that kind of work. If people do, then they'll be stronger than nation states potentially. We're almost out of time and we're introducing a whole lot of fascinating new big subjects. Let's try and do one or two questions quite quickly. I don't know if this is possible to answer quickly at all, by Paul Imre, uh, GDPR will be an issue. Any work on the legal stuff? So GDPR, for those who are not quite sure, is the set of legal rules in the EU now and governing uh, where our data goes and how much control we've got over them. All this uh, possible ideas about future personality and so on, is that going to be boosted or held up by GDPR mm. version one, two, three, and four? I don't know, but I think we're, I think we'll, I don't see GDPR necessarily surviving because I think it's difficult with regulation, is it? Because you can't regulate something before it's happened. It's so hard to sort of anticipate. You have to wait for the thing to happen and then you can apply some sort of regulations. But I think all of the stuff that's happening in the virtual world and that we were just, you know, we were just demonstrating and just showing and talking about, I think in the end, maybe not in the near future, but the end is going to massively surpass GDPR. I think it will just look old fashioned and out of touch and it actually won't be very helpful. It, the annoying thing about GDPR, of course, is that like with all this sort of regulation is um, it benefits the oligarchs. It benefits those who already have the power in the system. Um, and I think we'll, I don't know, I think we'll find smaller innovators hopefully coming through in areas that aren't really at the moment so obviously regulated by GDPR and then those will just su surpass and supersede what GDPR was trying to do. We talked about some of the distress and difficulties and confusion that might be caused by virtual reality identities, but virtual rendezvous has a slightly more positive question. Couldn't some of these deeply intimate connections created by virtual reality actually help bridge people uh, to uh, a, a new future? Yes, I think both of these things are true. They can both be true at the same time, which is again why I'm asking, can your identity survive in brackets, even thrive um, in 21st century technology? Yes, I, I absolutely think we, that is possible and that we should explore it more and that there's huge potential for it. Um, you know, it's an extension of our humanity potentially. And there are examples in your book as well, which we won't have time to go into just now, but maybe you can answer this one about your book by Alan Crowley. Is there or will there, will there be an audio version of the book in due course? Apparently there isn't an audio version of it right now. Um, I don't know whether there will be when the paperback comes out, um, but no. It's the hardback version at the moment. Sorry, Alan. <laughs> well, the hardback version is very pretty, I have to say. I don't read many hardback books these days, uh, but I certainly enjoyed reading this one. Uh, maybe a virtual version of yourself, Tracy, you can do all the reading virtually without yeah. you having to I, sit I down no, and re read them one by one. I think there's no audio version because no one wants to hear my Brummie accent, but we could use somebody else, of course, so if there's any volunteers. <laughs> And in terms of uh, books or online uh, media, people in the chat have referred to other examples. They've referred to Ready Player One, which mm -hmm. was a book, uh, and uh, then uh, a film in which people certainly had different identities. There's reference to Transcendence, in which an identity was uploaded, and uh, 
and the various uh, Star Trek episodes as well got yeah. mentioned. And Black Mirror episodes, of course. Mm -hmm. and Black Mirror all tend to be a bit bleak. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, what, what do you think of the film Hair, for example? Because that also had uh, humans who were somehow psychologically troubled but finding a bit more positive yeah. experience online. Yeah, no, all of those, uh, all of those are sort of um, stimulus for the conversation in the debate. I liked her, but I still say that Advantageous is my, um, is my favourite. In fact, I'm going to tell you just a sidebar a little story before we go. I was told about Advantageous by a presentation at the World Future Society in 2015 by, um, I'm trying to think of uh, Janet Anderson. She did this amazing future of work presentation and she talked about advantageous. And then um, I left feeling very um, inspired by lots of stuff that happened at the World Future Society. But then I got on the plane and you came and sat next to me, Davey, because we ended up having seats next to each other. And then Shh. Morrissey got on the plane. <laughs> oh, I can't remember that. It's completely gone from my mind. <laughs> so you went to sat beside Morrissey instead of me. Is that how this story ends? finishes? <laughs> He got on the plane and then I was literally like, isn't that Morrissey? And David was like, who? Yes. <laughs> anyway. That's that, definitely, that I can't remember that. <laughs> but I do remember <laughs> the talk by Jeanette Anderson on the future of work. And that was a real was, tour de force. It was really good, wasn't it? And I would um, say to anybody, um, I'm sure David would agree, you know, suggest anybody, um, I think it's on Netflix, Advantageous. I think you can watch yes. it on Netflix. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. It's quite a... Uh, poignant film let's say it's it not is. rah it's rah rah poignant. positive uh, super but nor is it just a, a foolish uh, uh, warring uh, battle you know there's uh, much more nuanced it's very interesting because it's a female team it's a female protagonist female character and mostly um, all of the characters film it's a female director jennifer jennifer fang i did actually ask her for a quote and some ideas when i was researching and doing the book and she did come back to me very positively we had a chat about it but in the end she she, she she didn't um she won't give a, a specific quote but um she's worth um, following too i think she does amazing work so tracy in a minute i'm going to ask you just if there's any final closing thoughts but before we get there i would like to just talk a little bit about the future of london futurists having uh, had this session today i want to look ahead to what's coming next in three weeks time from today we have uh, another talk in a sense about the future of identity this is by a professor of philosophy from uh, Rome, Stefan Lorenz Sorgna, whose talk is going to be called We Have Always Been Cyborgs. He'll be drawing themes from his new book, forthcoming new book of that title, and also his previous book, which isn't that old, on transhumanism. So that's in three weeks' time. Four weeks' time is a talk by Phil Torres. Actually, I should have mentioned that a uh, Stefan Sorgner sometimes is called the bad boy of philosophy, and you might see why when you see him talk in three weeks' time. Phil Torres might sometimes be called the bad boy of uh, extinction uh, risks research. He has some quite distinctive views there, too. He'll be talking about his forthcoming book, Thinking About the End of the World. Uh, this is not about, uh, this next slide is not about an event. It is by somebody who has often spoken at London Futurist, Callum Chase. He has a new book available, which is a fictional book. And the reason I'm mentioning it is he has offered to London Futurist attendees free uh, copies of the audio version of his book. So if somebody were to send me a private message uh, in the chat, I will download the chat afterwards. And the first five who say Oracle, please, I uh, will forward the details to Callum and uh, we will find out how to get you a free copy of the audio book. Uh, as the publisher says, the book is about humanity creates God. Can humanity survive? The mind of a student named Matt has been uploaded into a supercomputer, but before he can achieve a fraction of his potential, his uploaded mind is captured and effectively frozen by a group within the US intelligence services. Then the plot thickens. A couple of years later, this group needs Matt's help to tackle an existential threat to humanity. The risks are terrifying, but Matt agrees to help. After all, he has his own plans for the future. So as the publisher says, it's a high concept techno thriller describing our future after the arrival on Earth of the first artificial super intelligence. 
looking ahead one week from today, this is not a London Futurist event, though, as I'll say in a minute, I am one of the panelists there. It is uh, an event happening online uh, from the London School of Economics on the future of humanity, looking at what they say is the most fundamental question about the future, what is our prospects for long-term survival? So they'll break it into four two-hour sessions, one on climate change, one on pandemics and synthetic biology, one on the future of AI, and one on more generally, how can we evaluate and address the risks of human extinction or catastrophic change? Just briefly run through some of the speakers there. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who is uh, an eminent uh, economist, one of the hundred most influential people in the world. He is talking about his views on surviving climate change along with Jürgen Bronstein from the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfast Center. And hi, I managed to slip in there as well uh, from uh, London Futurists. There is a panel, as I mentioned, looking beyond COVID-19, natural and engineered pandemics with speakers, including Andrew Pollard from the Oxford Vaccine Group. And two, might say quite controversial speakers, Baroness Harding, the head of NHS Test and Trace, one of the 10 most influential women in the UK, according to BBC Radio 4, and Sir Neil Ferguson, who heads up Imperial College's COVID-19 response team and did some of the early analysis on scenarios. Then there's this section, as I mentioned, on the perils of AI rage against the machine with Max Tegmark, uh, sometimes known as Mad Max, uh, who is the co-founder of the Future of Life Institute, author of a couple of fascinating books, including Life 3.0. Jan Tallinn is on that panel as well, the co-founder of Skype. Uh, Jade Leung, who is now at OpenAI, uh, expert on governance and policy for AI. And Stuart Russell, who is a very well-known professor of AI from Berkeley and has written about options for ensuring that AI remains human compatible. The last group, as I mentioned, are looking more generally at safeguarding humanity towards existential security. What are the unknown unknowns that need to be studied? And the Sandberg, a longtime friend of London Futurist, is there, as is Joan Roffling, who is president of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, as is Toby Ord, who has literally written the book recently on existential threats. His book is The Precipice, as is Lord Martin Rees, one time a cosmology lecturer whose lectures I attended many years ago in Cambridge. He is also Astronomer Royal and has written also on the dangers facing humanity. His book in Europe and in the UK was called Our Final Century. The American publisher retitled it Our Final Hour. So that's all happening online. And the only way into this is you've got to get onto Facebook. So, and that may rule some of you out. I don't know, unless you create uh, uh, another identity and you can read the details there. So that is in the past. Today, we have had this fascinating talk uh, with many, many angles to it. And the more I think about the different angles, the more I think the picture becomes richer and uh, more in need of serious attention. So thank you very much, Tracy. What final remarks would you like to leave in people's minds as we head off? I guess just a short one, really, which is whenever I go and look at philosophical discussions or debates or panel um, conversations, it's always about um, what is the self and how can we know the authentic self? And I think we are moving with this dimension of technology um, away from questions about the authenticity of the self and more towards questions of the um, integrity of the self. How do we keep the self together, controlled, managed? and part of ourself and feel that we are self-sovereign. So if anybody wants to continue that conversation, I'd be very happy to um, on Twitter or LinkedIn or email me or whatever. Um, I wanna get the debate going so that we can, we can have that conversation now. It is a great debate. So some of us are probably 
intellectually tired out by this uh, fascinating workout, one or two of us might want to do what Brian Hall has just suggested in chat. He's inviting us to the virtual pub. Uh, so he has uh, created a meet event, which I will click on shortly, but uh, those uh, attending who would just like to chill out in a, a virtual online space for a short while, by all means, see that there in the chat. But I will now shut down the recording and say once again, thank you very much, Tracy Follows. Thank you.